Need some new Modern Horizons cards? Well, you can pre-order them from our sponsor, Card Kingdom, by heading over to CardKingdom.com. Hello everyone, it's Seth, probably better known as Saffron Olive, and it's time for another daily dose of Modern Horizons 2 spoilers, and today we have some really exciting stuff, including the newest member of a mega cycle that Wizards has been working on for 20 years now or something, so we should probably jump right into it, start talking sweet new Modern Horizons 2 cards, and first up today, we have the newest member of the sword cycle sword of hearth and home so this is a cycle that wizards has been slowly working on since original mirrored in black for almost 20 years now this is sword number eight so with sword of hearth and home we're now two swords away from completing the 10 card mega cycle although it looks like we're not going to get another one in modern horizons to itself it's uh, been number crunched out so unless there's some weirdness it appears that there's only one sword in the set so probably gonna have to wait until modern horizons three, maybe a return to New Phyrexia or Mirrodin to get another member of the sword cycle. But Sword of Hearth and Home, this sword is actually pretty sweet. So it's three mana, two to equip, like every other sword. Gives an equipped creature plus two plus two in protection from green and white. And then it has two abilities. When the equipped creature deals combat damage to a player, you get to exile up to one target creature you own and search your library for a basic land card. Put both cards onto the battlefield under your control and then shuffle your library. So Sword of Hearth and Home, you're essentially getting, a, with its combat damage trigger, a cloud shift where you can flicker one of your own creatures, reuse its enter the battlefield trigger, and then also a rampant growth, which I think actually makes this sword pretty powerful. One of the biggest disappointments for me from the first Modern Horizons is that the swords, which are so iconic, were just not very good. Sword of Sidhu and Steel, Sword of Truth and Justice, lower tier swords for sure. Sword of Hearth and Home, definitely way better than the MH1 swords. On the other hand, I don't think it's quite on the level of the best swords, sort of Fire and Ice, Feast and Famine, Light and Shadow. Those are traditionally the top tier swords. I would say that Sword of Hearth and Home kind of ranks in between. It's definitely not D tier like the worst swords. It's definitely not A tier like the best swords, but I would say it's a solid like low B maybe, somewhere in that range. A card that can definitely see play. I think the most obvious home for this card is going to be in Commander. If you look at Commander, Sword of the Animist is a card that is already a staple equipment. It's actually one of the five most played equipment in the format. And Sword of the Animist, two to cast, two to equip, gives the equipped creature plus one, plus one. And when a crypt creature attacks, you can search for a basic land, put it into play tapped. Sword of Hearth and Home essentially does what Sword of Animist does for plus one mana, but it pups your creature more. It gives you double protection. It has flicker synergies. And when it hits your opponent, it still lets you tutor out a basic land. I mean, sure, you got to take and actually hit your opponent when sort of the animus triggers on attack, but really... This is just like Sword of the Animist on steroids, and Sword of the Animist is already one of the most played equipment in the entire Commander format. So I think that Sword of Hearth and Home, at a minimum, it's going to be a Commander staple. It is going to immediately be one of the most played equipment in the format. I would be surprised if it wasn't maybe the most played sword in all of Commander, which is saying something because the swords are a very strong cycle. As far as modern... This is where it gets a little bit tricky. So the upside of Sword and Hearth and Home is there are some cool shenanigans and potential homes. I think if you're playing this in modern, you're probably playing it primarily for its blink effect, which maybe could make it work in like a Soul Herder or Stoneforge hybrid. I think it's pretty cute that you can like use Stoneforge to get Sword of Hearth and Home, and then you can hit your opponent with the sword, and then you can blink Stoneforge to get another sword or a batter skull or whatever equipment you want. Plus the blinking effect works really well with Soul Herder shenanigans. If you're picking up your Eternal Witness and getting the ETB to get something back from your graveyard or whatever. So there are possibilities. Would I play this in just a generic Stoneblade deck? I think the answer is almost certainly not. I don't think it does enough to show up in a generic Stoneblade deck because those decks are often controlling, don't have that many creatures. Uh, but in a Soul Herder style deck, we have a bunch of creatures, good ETB triggers. You're blinking your Ice Fang Quaddle again and again and again every turn to draw cards or whatever. That's actually a pretty powerful effect. The big 
biggest issue I see with Sword of Hearth and Home is that protection isn't great. I would say this is one of the weaker protection colors. Like, sure, Pro White does stop Path to Exile, which is nice. On the other hand, Green is one of the weakest removal colors. They got some, like, fight spells, I guess. But really, you're not super worried about Green killing your creatures. On the other hand, both White and Green are really good at killing Sword, so your opponent doesn't have to kill the creature that's wearing Sword. They can just Generous Gift or Beast with or Skyclave Apparition or Reclamation Sage, very heavily played green and white cards, and get rid of this sword itself. So I feel like the protection's weak, and sort of Hearth and Home, its protection colors obviously don't protect it, and the colors it protects are really good at killing artifacts, so I really like this card. As I mentioned in the intro... I feel like this is a step below the best swords that we've seen. At the same time, I definitely feel like it's a step or two above the worst swords that we've seen. Immediate commander stable. This card is going to be great and heavily played. If you're playing Sword of the Animist, I would say you just play this instead. Like, uh, budget considerations aside, is a mythic. It's probably going to be sort of expensive. But budget considerations inside, to me, this is just a better Sword of the Animist. And Sword of the Animist, as I mentioned, already one of the best equipments in Commander in Modern. I'm definitely going to try it in some sort of Stoneforge, Soul Herder, hybrid mashup deck. Whether or not it actually catches on, that remains to be seen, but it is a really sweet sword. And it's awesome to see not just the sword cycle return, but an actual good one that actually does things after the disappointment of the swords in Modern Horizons 1. Next up... We have a card that I don't even know what to say. I have never seen a card like this. Something completely new i think i love it but maybe it's horrible i have no idea meet garth one-eyed i'm at a loss for words i'm never at a loss for words about magic but i am at a loss for words about this card so it is a five color legendary human wizard you get a five five the part that blows my mind is its ability tap it choose a card name that hasn't been chosen from among disenchant brain geyser terror shivan dragon regrowth black lotus create a copy of that card with the chosen name and you can cast the copy you still got to pay its cost so essentially garth is a card that gives you some of the most iconic alpha cards in the game's history. I mean, by tapping this legend, you get to choose from a artifact and enchantment destruction spell, which still sees some competitive play, brain geyser, a huge X draw spell, terror, a somewhat limited because it doesn't hit black and artifact creatures, but a decent removal spell, shiv and dragon, just a big iconic flyer, regrowth to get something back from your hand, and honest to goodness, black lotus, I don't even know what to say. This card is absolutely ridiculous. I mean, I don't think this is going to be a card that probably sees, like, competitive modern play or legacy play or anything like that, but we have never seen anything like this before. This is a card that refers to six other cards, and you have to know what those other cards are to actually use it, and then it creates copies of those other cards. Obviously, if it's a permanent, like Black Lotus or Shivan Dragon, it's going to be a token. This is something that we have just never seen before, and the entire history of Magic the Gathering. One thing I want to point out about this, which I think is really, really exciting, and I hope Wizards does more of, is Garth makes a Black Lotus token. That's one of its abilities. Black Lotus is the most expensive card in Magic, and we can't reprint it because of the reserve list. Cards like Garth that make token versions of old reserve list cards are actually a really sneaky way for Wizards to unofficially print proxies of those cards. Like, a Black Lotus token is going to be an excellent proxy that you'll get for free, theoretically, by a buying pack. So I hope that we actually see a Black Lotus token and a Shiva Dragon token. As far as what you do with this card... I'm going to play in Commander. I think this might be my new favorite five-color Commander. Is it as busted as Golos or Kenrith? Probably not. Is it as mm, janky as a Tagatog? Probably not. But I think this is my new default five-color Commander. If I ever have a five-color deck that doesn't really have a strong theme, I think Garth One-Eyed is going to be what I go for because it does do pretty much everything. We were talking about what it does. It offers removal. It offers card advantage. It offers big creatures. It offers recursion. It offers offers mana ramp. It does everything all in one, 
in such a unique, insane way. Also, there is some combo potential here. The one, I guess, trick to Garth is blinking it. So uh, as you read Garth, you notice that you have to choose a different thing each time. So once you choose Black Lotus, you can't choose it again. Or once you choose, I don't know, uh, Terror, you can't choose Terror again and get another removal spell. However, if you can blink Garth with Deadeye Navigator, Ephemerate, Flicker Whist, there's a ton of things that can do it. Or if it dies and goes back to your command zone and then you cast it again or you cast a new copy, that is going to reset the choices. So this opens up some interesting combo potential. Like, let's say you have a Garth and a Deadeye Navigator and something that gives Mast Haste like Fervor, you can take in Soul Bond, Deadeye Navigator, and Garth. You can choose Black Lotus with Garth to make two mana. You can crack that for blue mana. You can blink Garth with Deadeye Navigator. And then you could choose Black Lotus again to make another artifact that makes three mana, blink it for two mana again and again and again. That's going to give you infinite mana. Eventually, you'll have a ton of blue mana stored up that you can use with Deadeye Navigator. And then you can start resetting Garth and choosing uh, Brain Geyser to draw your entire deck. You can choose Shivan Dragon to make a whole bunch of creatures, whatever. You got tons of options once you get going uh, and you have infinite mana, then you can do all kinds of shenanigans. So I think that Garth is, it's jaw dropping. It's jaw dropping, not in terms of its power level, although I do think it is a powerful commander. We've never seen anything like this before. This is the most iconic, weirdest thing. It's like a custom magic card. It looks like a custom magic card that you would see on a Reddit post or something, but it's an actual real card. It's doing tons of things that we have never seen before. It's an iconic character from Magic's novels from the past. I think I love this card. It's so weird that I'm still soaking it in and trying to figure it out. Right now, I'm leaning towards love it, but I don't know how I'll feel like a week from now, but Garth One-Eyed. We've never seen anything like it, and I am excited to play this card in Commander. Again, I don't think it's going to see playing Modern or anything like that. Another Commander-focused card, but good lord, is this a cool card with a ton of cool references and tokens of expensive reserve list cards. Could be a good way to get around the reserve list, provide needed unofficial proxies to players. So there's a lot to like about this card, but also a lot to soak in because it is just so, so strange. We also got a really interesting hate card in Void Mirror. So Void Mirror, two mana artifact that says whenever a player casts a spell, if no colored mana was spent to cast it, counter that spell. So essentially, hate on colorless stuff and also on free spells and really a bunch of stuff that we'll talk about as we go along. This is a really, really powerful hate card. This is not a card that you're going to play in your main deck, but it is a card that you can play in your sideboard and hate on specific archetypes. So the meme is this is good against Tron, but it's actually really not that good against Tron because here's how Void Mirror works. It doesn't counter colorless cards. It counters any card if no colored mana was spent on it. So let's say you're playing against Tron, and they want to cast their Karn Liberated. Of course, they can't go tap my three Tron lands Karn Liberated because that's all colorless mana, so it would get countered, but your opponent can tap one forest, let's say. Throw that mana into the mix with their Tron mana, and then their Karn resolves normally. So I guess it could slow down some draws against the Tron deck, but it's really not that good against Tron. On the other hand, it is absurd against Eldrazi Tron. If you're tired of losing to Eldrazi Tron, Void Mirror by itself, I think, just beats it. Like, Eldrazi Tron, at least the current builds of it, have zero ways to make colored mana. Like, none in their entire deck. Every land is colorless. There's no mana rocks that make colored mana. So if you just stick this on turn two against Eldrazi Tron, every single spell they cast for the rest of the game will get countered. Maybe the Eldrazi Tron deck can evolve and play more colored mana sources to get around it, but as it is right now, Void Mirror just game over against Eldrazi Tron, but really, this hates on a lot of different things. I think maybe the most exciting part is this is really good hate for free spells. Uh, if you're playing against, like, Restore Balance, As Foretold, Crashing Footfall shenanigans, if you cast a Restore Balance off and As Foretold, obviously not spending any colored mana on it because you're spending zero mana on it altogether, so it gets countered. If your opponent's casting Mutagenic Grow, 
Growth and there is a prowess deck and not spending mana on it, they gotta spend life because they don't have green mana, it's gonna get countered. Force and negation, force of will, gonna get countered if your opponent pays it, plays it for the free mode. Grief, if your opponent evokes it, gonna get countered. The stuff that comes into play off a Burgeon Ultimatum, gonna get countered. Bloodbraid Elf cascading into something blockers, gonna get countered. So Void Mirror actually hits on a surprising number of things. I think right now in modern, I would at least consider this as a sideboard card. It wrecks Eldrazi Tron, it wrecks the free spell deck, and then it does something against a lot of other decks as well. So I think it does enough that I would consider this in my sideboard slot. The other place to consider this card is Vintage, although in Vintage, I'm not really sure how good this is going to be. So on one hand, you do have decks like Stacks and Shops, which are primarily colorless. You also have Dredge decks, which can get a lot of value without casting cards, but you want to cast like hollow ones and whatnot. Void Mirror does hit on a lot of the cards in the deck. On the other hand, in Vintage, most decks are playing Moxin, so it seems like it'll be pretty easy for decks to get around if you're playing all the Moxin, because you just add one Moxin in with your colorless mana, and that's going to be enough to resolve your spell. So we'll see if that's actually good enough. The other consideration is Commander. I've heard some people worrying about what this might do in Commander. I don't think this does enough enough that you would play it. Like, obviously, if your playgroup has multiple people that are playing colorless commander decks, then Void Mirror could be a hilarious way just to hard lock someone out of the game. On the other hand, it's not going to do anything in most commander matchups, so it could be a funny option to, like, troll your friend's Emrakul deck or Kozilek deck or whatever. But outside of that, I don't actually think it's going to be a playable commander card, but it does have a lot of implications in modern in Legacy, maybe back to Vintage, so I really like this card. It hates on something that we haven't really seen before. Game over against Eldrazi Tron, which I'll never complain about, and picks up on a lot of fringe cards as well, so really cool new hate card coming in Modern Horizons 2. Next up, we have a pretty exciting new to Modern reprint, and remember, new to Modern reprints are coming in their own slot and packs, so they're a bonus. You can get a rare new to Modern reprint and a normal rare mythic in the same pack and our card today is Patriarch's Bidding, and it is a good one on multiple levels. So first off, Patriarch's Bidding, it's really old, it's never really gotten a proper reprint, and it's like $50. And remember, this is the bonus slot. This is the bonus one in every pack. Uh, maybe I get this, and I get a sword, or some other busted thing in the pack. So that is some nice value in the bonus slot. As far as the card itself, it is five mana, and each player chooses a creature type, and then each player returns all creatures of the chosen type from their graveyard to the battlefield. So, mass reanimation for tribal decks, most of it expense is due to its commander playability. And in commander, it shows up in a relatively narrow subset of decks. It shows up in tribal decks that have black mana. So if you're playing like Anami Spirits, maybe you're playing Slivers, maybe you're playing five color dragons, or red black goblins, or red black minotaurs, Patriarch's Bidding is just a good value card. It gives you protection from a wrath your opponent takes in, uh, wraths the board, all of your creatures die. This is a way you're like, all right, sure, whatever, five mana, get all my slivers back, or spirits, or some whatever, dragons. So that's its main purpose in Commander, but this is a card that I actually think has some amount of potential in Modern. I'm not saying it's going to break Modern or anything, but we've had some success in Modern with cards like Return to the Ranks, Rally the Ancestors, these mass reanimation effects, especially in Sacrifice or Aristocrat-style decks, where you, like, sack your board, reanimate everything, sack your board again, drain your opponent out of the game with Blood Artist type triggers, Patriarch's Bidding is more powerful than either of these cards. This is just five mana, get back all of your stuff, but it comes with the deck building restriction that you gotta be able to build a tribal sacrifice deck. The good news is there's three tribes in modern that I think could easily pull this off. So first, Zombies got a lot of potential. Zombies, they have ways to fill the graveyard like Stitcher Supplier. They have good sacrifice outlets like Carrion Feeder. They have sacrifice payoffs like Undead Augur, Diagraph Captain is essentially a blood artist for zombies, except you don't gain life. They have stuff like Giraffe's Messenger, which just coming into play a few times can drain the opponent out of the game directly. So I think you could build some sort of like zombie aristocrat deck where Patriarch's bidding is the top end of your curve. You sack all of your stuff, you reanimate all your stuff, you win the game by sacrificing all your stuff again. Another option, and maybe the most obvious one, is vampires, because vampires, they are the home to multiple blood 
artists, in fact. You get literal blood artists. You get cruel celebrant. You even get, like, Falcon Wrath Noble. So you get all of the blood artist effects. Then you get good sack outlets, Vizier Azir, Bloodthorn Vampire, Falcon Wrath Aristocrat. It seems pretty easy to play some self-mill stuff. Set up a Patriarch's Bidding, where you get back a bunch of blood artists, sacrifice a few creatures, and win the game on the spot. The other home, and this might be the most competitive, is Goblins. So Goblins, already a legitimate, like, second tier, sometimes top tier deck in the format, and the top tier builds of Goblins, already you're playing Sacrifice stuff, Slinging Lieutenant, Skirk Prospector, they're already paying Sacrifice payoffs, Slinging Lieutenant, Facilic Mons, so I feel like Patriarch Spitting could either be a backup main deck, like, combo plan. If you're not winning with the Snoop combo, maybe just Sacrifice a bunch of random Goblins, get them all back, drain your opponent out of the game, or at worst, a good sideboard plan for the Goblin deck. So I actually think Patriarch Spitting has a reasonable chance to show up in modern. The other possibility, which I'm much less excited for, is just playing it for value in a tribal deck. I guess, like, in theory, maybe you're playing Black White Humans, and you're, like, worried about Supreme Verdict or, you know, Wrath of God. Could you play Patriarch Spitting to bring it in against control decks and be like, all right, you're going to Wrath me, I'm going to untap, I'm going to cast Patriarch Spitting and undo your Wrath, essentially. You're maybe some sort of blue-black merfolk-style deck. I mean, in theory, that could work. You could play it like Commander decks do, is Wrath Protection in your tribal deck. I'm not as excited about that plan as, a, like, setting up a sacrifice-based combo kill plan in Modern, but I actually think that Patriarch's bidding, while it is certainly a Commander-focused reprint, I actually think it has potential in Modern. Of course, there is a drawback, and that is... The plan is dependent on the graveyard, and modern decks are dependent on the graveyard, and modern decks tend to have a plan to deal with the graveyard, so keep that in mind, I don't think this is going to, like, break anything, but I do think we could have a legitimate deck based around sacrificing your stuff, getting it all back with Patriarch's bidding, and winning the game. We also got... A new blue card, Rise and Shine. So, two mana, target non-creature artifact you control, becomes a 0-0 zero, zero artifact creature, put four counters on each artifact that became a creature that way, and then you can overload it for six mana. So, essentially, this is like a... And in soul artifact, more or less, you can turn a artifact into a 4-4 four, four, that then, if you overload it, becomes like a march of the machines or a permanent antiquities war you can turn all your non-creature artifacts into four fours it is worth mentioning that uh it's a little different than a soul artifact in that rise and shine only hits non-creature artifacts which is relevant for the decks that would want to play this so the easiest thing to do with this is just like play a dark steel citadel make it into a four four indestructible start beating your opponent down or a mishra's bobble similar to how you would play a in soul artifact it's also worth mentioning that it kind of works within soul artifacts Artifact because in Soul Artifact just sets the base power and toughness of a creature to 5 5, and then Rise and Shine grows the creature with plus one plus one counters. You can turn a Dark Steel Citadel into like a 9 9 if you have both of them. You in Soul Artifact, and then you also add the four counters to it with Rise and Shine. Sure, it's a two card combo, but a 9 9 Dark Steel Citadel seems like a legitimate threat on like turn three in modern. The downside of Rise and Shine is it doesn't work with creatures, and cards like Ornithopter. Memnite are typically part of in soul artifact style decks because you just want as many cheap things as possible. You want a backup plan in creatures if your in soul artifact plan doesn't work. So Rise and Shine isn't going to help there. So it's going to take a little bit more work to build a Rise and Shine deck than an in soul artifact deck because some of the free artifacts in modern just don't actually count with Rise and Shine. But I think the overload potential is a big upside. Like, sure, this is, like, maybe a slightly worse than Soul Artifact. However, it has this upside where in the late game, you play a bunch of mana rocks or play a bunch of zero mana artifacts, and then you overload this, and suddenly you just have a massive board of four fours that maybe just kill your opponent in a single attack. So I think this card probably has a home in modern and budget decks, and then it definitely has a home in commander, but only in specific archetypes. I don't think that your average artifact deck in Commander is going to want this, turning your random artifact into a 4-4 just isn't really all that exciting, but if you're playing something like Sidri, which is about turning your non-creature artifacts into creatures, or something like Arkum, which really cares about non-creature artifacts, then Rise and Shine, I think, can be a nice upgrade and a potential finisher for the archetype. So Rise and Shine, I think a card's fun. 
excited to try a new take on Insole Artifact in Modern. My guess is it's a sweet budget deck, but not like a top tier archetype, but also has some interesting potential in Commander too. Finally today, in the world of lower rarity cards, we got, you know, some draft chaff, some cool references, extruder, cool callback to old juggernauts, bottle golems, harkens back to bottle gnomes, but the big winner I think is Young Necromancer, a 5 mana 2-3 human warlock that when it enters the battlefield, you can exile two cards from your graveyard, then if you do, you can return target creature card from your graveyard to the battlefield. So this is kind of a, a twist on Karmic Guide, Phyrexian Delver, these five mana creatures that don't have a lot of power, but they get to reanimate something when they come into play, and both Karmic Guide and Phyrexian Delver see quite a bit of play in Commander. I think Young Necromancer probably going to show up in Commander decks as well, also for the white-black reanimator limited archetype. The one thing about Young Necromancer is it is, I think, worse than Karmic Guide, and maybe even Phyrexian Delver a little bit because you can't really combo with it. One of the things you can do with Karmic Guide is like loop it with things like Dead Eye Navigator or Revel Arc. With Young Necromancer, gonna be hard to do because of the Exile 2 card clause. Like you're gonna run out of cards in your graveyard eventually, so it's kind of like a, a Karmic Guide that you can't go infinite with, at least not very easily, but I still think this is going to show up in a lot of reanimation based commander decks. If you're playing Chainer or Gyrus or Cedrus, or if you're doubling up ETBs with Yarok, Young Necromancer seems great in those decks, especially with some of the commanders that can reanimate stuff, like Gyrus. Like, you get back your Young Necromancer, that's going to let you reanimate something else for free, so you kind of get a two for one with your reanimation, which means even though it's a fair version of Karmic Guide, it's still a pretty powerful commander card. Lastly today, one Old Border Modern Horizon, one reprint in Deep Forest Hermit. Not a very expensive card, but might be on the rise. Now that we're getting more Squirrel support, definitely going to want it for your Squirrel Commander deck. Or maybe Modern Squirrels can be a thing. Anyway, that brings us to the end of our Modern Horizons 2 daily spoilers for today. So, what do you think? How good is our new sword? Can that show up in Modern, or is it just a Commander staple? What do you think about Garth One-Eyed? Is that the sweetest card ever? The weirdest card ever? Do you love it? Do you hate it? All the other stuff, let me know what you think about that as well. Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. And I'll be back tomorrow with more Modern Horizons 2 spoilers. So until then, everyone, have a great day, and I will talk to you soon. Thanks for watching the video. If you enjoyed it, help us out by clicking that like button down below. And to keep up on all the latest and greatest, click that subscribe button. And don't forget to hit that bell icon to get alerts whenever we have new videos. And if you want to, check out some of our other sweet videos here and here.